welcome back, everyone. So I have to admit, I have been really looking forward to the next conversation. Abraham Loeb is the Frank B. Byrd Jr. Professor of Science at Harvard University and an international best-selling author. A trained physicist, Loeb is the director of the Institute for Theory and Computation within the Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics. And he also serves as the head of the Galileo Project, which is focused on systematic scientific search for evidence of extraterrestrial technological civilizations. Welcome, Avi Loeb. Thanks for having me. It's a great pleasure. Great to have you. You hear the applause. Everyone is very excited. And I think um, probably some um, participants have read your recent publication. Um, that's an article in which you argue that our universe could have been created in a laboratory of an advanced technological civilization. Could we say humanity is then basically a computer game played by someone we don't know and don't understand? Not at all a computer game. There is a, a clear distinction between the real world and virtual reality, which is on computers. What I'm saying is that a sufficiently advanced scientific civilization is a good approximation to God. We are already uh, producing almost synthetic life in our laboratories. It will take us perhaps another decade. And uh, we can imagine that at some point we'll understand uh, through the scientific method, how to unify quantum mechanics and gravity. And at that point, it might be possible to create a baby universe in our laboratory. Now, this may take some time, but most stars formed billions of years before the sun. And there could be a technological civilization that predated us a billion years before us. And if you think about our future in a billion years, we might well be in a position to do magic or to, in, in other words, to uh, perform the duties that we assigned in religious scripts to God. And so my point is simple. Um, you know, a, a caveman that finds a cell phone would at first think that it's a rock, but could in principle examine the cell phone and press buttons on it and figure out that it's not a rock. So we can search the sky and look for equipment that looks unusual, doesn't look like a rock. We might not be able to figure it out, but it will imply that there is a smarter kid on our cosmic block. That's actually the, the logic deduction uh, from, from what you're saying. If another technical civilization could have created us, that definitely means that we are not the smartest kids on the block in our universe. So that's kind of a, well, narcissistic wound for humanity. What, what can you offer as a consolation for that? Right, so I think, um, you know, uh, we as uh, conscious beings are getting a lot of information about ourselves first. And therefore we get attached to ourselves, and uh, we keep following our ego. So we tell ourselves we are at the center of the universe, we are the smartest, we are privileged. Uh, and that resembles uh, my daughters when they were young. They thought that they are the smartest in the world until they went to the kindergarten and met other kids. And uh, in my view, uh, the second phase of becoming conscious is not conscious of yourself, but of your environment, of the fact that you are just one small piece in this bigger scene. Uh, and in fact, there could be others that are better than you are. And we refuse to admit that. Uh, after realizing that we are not at the center of the universe, we kept saying, oh, maybe the Earth-Sun system is privileged. By now we know that half of the sun-like stars have a planet the size of the Earth, roughly at the same separation. We are not privileged at all. And many scientists still maintain the view that as intelligent beings, we are privileged. Of course, that flatters our ego. And we could search for primitive life, like microbes on the surface of Mars. But just imagine if the Perseverance rover would bump into the wreckage of a spaceship that represents technologies far more advanced than we possess. It will be a blow to our ego. So my point is, let's start from zero. Let's basically say anything we see around us is sort of typical. We are, not we are in the middle of 
the class of intelligent civilizations out there. You know, I tell my students on the first day of class, usually, half of you are below the median, because that's how the median is defined in statistics. There is no way to escape from that verdict, because in any class, half of the students are below the median. And they have a problem with that, because all of them want to belong to the top few percent. But as a civilization, I say, let's assume that we are in the middle of the distribution and that something more advanced than us existed a billion years ago. And we don't need to argue about this. It's not a philosophical question. Let's just search the sky. Let's put funds into this search. And for some reason, it's pushed outside of the mainstream right now. But I'm trying to bring it into the mainstream of science. So what I really liked about your, your answer now is that we kind of need more meta-consciousness in this huge universal kindergarten we are all in at the moment. That, that's a really nice <laughs> metaphor. Um, I wanted to get back to one, one more aspect you were mentioning in your first answer because you talked about God. And your theory unifies the religious notion of creation with the secular notion of quantum gravity. So um, when I try to consider that, I wonder what happened to the various versions of God our human civilization tends to believe in, and did you even get something like death threat uh, for what you're uh, proposing? Not at all. I was actually attending a forum in the Washington National Cathedral, and uh, I was speaking with two reverends, uh, two religious authorities about this subject, and uh, they actually was uh, very embracing to this notion. And I should say that I get more positive feedback from religious people than from secular scientists, which is surprising. But in that forum that I attended, uh, another uh, panelist was Jeff Bezos of uh, Blue Origins and Amazon. And uh, uh, he was talking about uh, space tourism and sending a million people or maybe even a trillion people to space. And he was thinking about the commercial benefits and I thought to myself, you know, there is no commercial business plan to get out of the solar system. You cannot imagine making a profit out of getting outside of the solar system. The only reason to do that would be spirituality, some aspiration for something bigger than money. And, you know, to me, um, exploration of space and spirituality are connected. I like that a lot, spirituality. I, I still think that might be one reason. The other reason might be, um, well, self-imposture, because we have to prove, or a specific person has to prove that he or she could do it. Right. Yeah, so um, the one thing I learned over several decades of doing astronomy, practicing uh, as a scientist, is a sense of modesty. And uh, when you are modest, you basically say, I will follow whatever the evidence shows. I don't know the answer in advance. And also, you know, I'm not at the center of the stage. I'm not at the center of the universe. Um, you know, we just came to the scene, to this play, a cosmic play. At the end, uh, the universe started 13.8 billion years ago. We are certainly not the main characters in this play. And we better search if there are other actors out there. And when you start from this point of view of modesty, then you are allowing yourself to learn something new. But, uh, you know, a, a lot of my colleagues are basically saying, uh, we can forecast everything we find based on what we already know. We are experts. They give each other awards and honors, and that flatters their ego, and they get a lot of likes on Twitter. But it doesn't necessarily advance our knowledge. And we know that because four centuries ago, the philosophers argued the sun moves around the earth. And they refused to look through Galileo's telescope because they knew the answer in advance. And nowadays, when we launch space missions, nobody remembers those philosophers. We only remember Galileo because we have to calculate the trajectory of the spacecraft based on the motion of the earth around the sun. There is no doubt that the earth moves around the sun. So reality is whatever it is. It doesn't require a lot of likes on Twitter. It's irrelevant what people think and what people force each other to think. So let's dive a little bit deeper in, into what your theory entails. So um, it could mean that our life's purpose could have been defined by an extraterrestrial technological civilization. And if so, 
what was that purpose and have we fulfilled the expectations that some alien civilization has uh, put on us? Well, uh, based on the response to my book from the scientific community, I would say the aliens must be disappointed with the experiment because <laughs> we haven't demonstrated that we are very intelligent because a lot of people still argue, you know, we need extraordinary evidence before even engaging in this discussion that there might be equipment out there. I talk in my book about one object that the first one that we found from outside the solar system that didn't look like a typical comet or an asteroid and I suggested that it might be artificial. And um, a lot of my colleagues resisted that. One of them even said, uh, this object is so weird, I wish it never existed, because it threatens, again, the ego of the experts, so to speak, to admit that there is something in reality that they don't fully understand. But I am acting to any new evidence just like a kid. You know, I'm trying to figure out the world. I don't see it as a blow to my ego if reality ends up being different than my preconceptions. And I think it's the most important question that we can address. Uh, you know, are we alone? Are we the smartest kid on the block? Probably not. And uh, my point is, you know, how can uh, the science in the 21st century ignore this question when the public cares so much about it? And the government, by the way, uh, as well. The government released a report, I mean, from the director of national intelligence to Congress, the U.S. Congress, uh, admitting that uh, it doesn't understand objects flying above in the sky and it wants more scientific inquiry into it. And actually, this this week, uh, the Congress uh, decided to establish uh, an office in government that we look into the data that was collected so far. So, so I think the government and the public have their hearts in the right place. They are curious. It's just that mainstream scientists uh, appear to behave just like the church did during the days of Galileo. Well, that's, that's a very interesting um, position. And I think that is something we should really think about because uh, if, you, if you deal with the amazing um, uh, phenomenon of our universe and then you stick to basically the little drawers of our um, uh, thought uh, framework, then that's, that's kind of sad. And it's also related to you arguing that the idea of humanity having been created in an alien lab would assign new meaning to the existence of humanity. Could you yeah, explain exactly. why, why you think so? Yeah, so, you know, people ask very often, what is the meaning of life? And one possibility is uh, that we would get the answer from figuring out that there is someone out there that either created our life, uh, and I'm talking about the scientific civilization, not a divine entity that is an abstract philosophical notion, but, you know, a culture that developed science to a level higher than we currently possess. It's a very simple idea. Um, or that they would know the answer based on a much larger amount of information that they collected over a billion years. You know, we had modern science only for a century, so they might be much more advanced in terms of knowing for example, what the universe is made of, what the dark matter is, what was there before the Big Bang, and so forth. So we can learn from them. The way I see it is by going to the kindergarten and finding smarter kids, you can learn something new that you didn't know before. And I see it as an opportunity rather than as a threat to my ego. So we have one question uh, from our audience uh, in the chat. I would like to, to uh, extend to you. Katharina asks um, if you could elaborate on why um, your fas fascinating research uh, or whether your fascinating research shows why we are here ex uh, ex um, expressively and um, if uh, there um, could be some, some sort of experiment as a reason that uh, humanity um, appeared, maybe even in intent unintentionally, yeah, conceptually, it's possible to imagine such an experiment and such an understanding. But at the moment, uh, a few months ago, I established the first scientific project uh, that is aimed, the Galileo project, that is aimed to uh, look for equipment uh, from other civilizations that may be floating in space within the orbit of the Earth around the sun or maybe closer to us in the atmosphere of the Earth. 
And it's really the very first time that a group of scientists decided to build uh, in, uh, telescope systems, observatories, that would monitor the sky or chase an object like the one I mentioned before that is discussed in my book, uh, Extraterrestrial, that uh, whose nature is unclear. If we, you know, they often say a picture is worth a thousand words. In my case, a picture is worth 66,000 words, the number of words in my book. If I had a megapixel image of this strange object, uh, I wouldn't need to write the book. We would know if it has screws or bolts or buttons that we can press versus a rock of a type that we have never seen before. We, we have often heard uh, Elon Musk talking about that we are all part of some elaborate simulation. Um, how, how would you distinguish, distinguish your theoretical approach from what he is talking about? Right, so a simulation is um, information that is kept on the computer, it's not reality, okay? And uh, the way to think of this is uh, that, um, you know, people that have to struggle uh, for making a living, that have to go to the bank and check how much money they have in their bank account, know that there is something to reality that is different from your thoughts, your ideas. And perhaps someone that has enough money uh, that doesn't need to worry about going to the bank and think that we live in a simulation because reality doesn't bite that person. Uh, I think there is a clear distinction between imagined reality, virtual reality, and reality itself, which we can experiment with, which we can test and check. And uh, it's a very different concept to do something in the laboratory, in an experiment, and to do it on the computer. These are completely different things. And of course, you can put goggles on your eyes uh, the way that uh, Mark Zuckerberg is envisioning with Meta uh, and imagine some virtual reality in which you get anything you want, but that will not get you what you want in the reality that we live in. It will just be in your mind. It will not be the shared reality of all of us. And you know, the clear distinction is evident, for example, from uh, the Ponzi scheme of Bernie Madoff that promised beautiful things to people, they believed him, gave him the money, and when they asked for the money back, he couldn't deliver. So that was clear that when you do the experiment, you know, you can realize if what he was talking about is real or not and decide whether to put the person in jail. You talked about the Galileo uh, project before um, you're heading, and um, the project is looking uh, for techno technologically uh, enhanced or, or advanced civilizations. So technology always seems to be a very important role as it gives civilizations the, 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 the um, possibility to, to evolve in a way. How is, in general, technology entangled with the lifespan of a civilization, especially of humanity? Yeah, that's an excellent question. So, you know, we envisioned uh, ourselves uh, going uh, out of this Earth into space in the form of astronauts for many decades now. And unfortunately, humans were selected by Darwinian evolution to survive on the surface of this rock. We were not designed to survive in the hazardous co conditions of space where you have energetic particles that could destroy a significant fraction of the brain cells in our head you know, within a few years. So um, my view is we should be proud of systems that we produce, technological systems. For example, artificial intelligence is now used to drive cars. And in the future, we can imagine astronauts that are equipped with artificial intelligence, not natural intelligence. And I call those AI astronauts, and they would be much better than human astronauts because they can survive for long journeys. They are not impacted because they're made of electronics. They will not be vulnerable to energetic particles as we are. And uh, we should be proud of our technological kids. You know, we can train them early on to do what we want and send them to space. I call that AI astronauts. And uh, when we can envision that, it means that someone else that was at our phase maybe a billion years ago may have already done that. And that's what I'm advocating for in the Galileo project, looking for AI astronauts, looking for systems that might be very smart, but do not have any biological creature in them. Uh, and that's what I think is the most likely scenario for an encounter in the future. And obviously we call it the Galileo project because we want to find the answer 
by looking through our telescopes. We don't want to repeat the mistake of the philosophers four centuries ago. Well, AI astronauts, that's, that's really a perspective. I have another excellent question from our audience. Alice wants to know, do you think, Avi, that the answer to our origin is already encoded in our conscious or subconscious mind, and can it be retrieved? Well, everything is possible. As some people suggested perhaps our DNA has some information encoded uh, about uh, where we came from, or um, uh, consciousness is not fully understood. Um, uh, it, it may be just an emergent phenomena that uh, we, we have a very complex system of neurons in, in our brain and, and uh, something comes out of those, that arrangement that is not fully understood. I mean, even artificial intelligence uh, systems right now are doing things that we cannot fully understand. We don't understand how they arrive at some conclusions, how they play chess, how they play Go, how do they win. Uh, games with people. So it's possible that consciousness is something like that, but it's also possible that it, it's beyond that. And um, it's difficult for me to say anything about that because we don't understand consciousness. And uh, what I would say is I understand what it is to find a physical object. You know, this is something we can all understand. And uh, we should follow that track where, you know, it's just like, going through a path that was not taken and there is low hanging fruit. So you pick the low hanging fruit first, then you worry about more uh, high hanging fruit that is more complicated. Well, one school in quantum physics posits everything can happen, that can happen will happen an infinite number of times, means we live in a multiverse in which there are as many yous as there are universes that can split again and again infinitely. So that there are an infinite number of avis somewhere out there as well as an infinite number of Miriams. Does that make you happy or does that scare you in a way? Well, uh, neither of these. It makes me sad that people talk so much about something that cannot be tested because, you know, uh, we live for such a short time. We better not waste our time about ideas that cannot be checked. As I said before, there is a big difference between ideas and reality. Most of the ideas do not apply to reality. So how can we tell if the multiverse is a real idea? Only if it has a testable prediction that, you know, if everything is possible, then you can't test it because everything is possible. So whatever you find is possible. And uh, to me, that sounds <laughs> worse than a, a belief in, in, in some abstract entity that, you know, uh, uh, that, that some cults have. I mean, because here are scientists arguing that there might be something that we can never figure whether it exists. And that should not be part of science. You know, science should be focused on things that we can demonstrate that they are real. Otherwise, it might, it will not represent knowledge. It's just wishful thinking. You can think this and you can think that. And uh, it's also a, a, a recipe for being lazy because suppose uh, your, your child comes back from school and says, I got a bad grade today, but don't worry because in another part of the multiverse, there is a child just like me that got a good grade. You know, that's a, an opportunity for people to feel lazy. Good point. Um, you're, you're alluding to questions of accountability um, and uh, how, we, how we kind of um, design and shape our lives and what responsibility we take. I'm totally with you in that. But couldn't you, from a philosophical point of view, also turn it around and say it could make us, the idea of the multiverse from a ph philosophical point could make us more conscious about the decisions we take in our life? No, I would say... Uh, the decisions we make in our life should be shaped by what we know uh, to be real, uh, rather than what we assume that might be out there. Because um, what you know that is real, um, you know, can help you build on it. For example, if we know for real that the Earth moves around the sun, we can have uh, space missions based on that. Uh, but if we imagine that the sun moves around the Earth, you will never be able to launch a spacecraft that will go in the right direction because your, your model is wrong. And um, uh, 
I think that knowing reality has a great advantage, irrespective whether it flatters us or not. You know, a, a thousand years ago, there were people arguing that the human body should not be dissected, that anatomy should be forbidden, because people were saying the human body has a soul inside, and if you were to dissect it, you will hurt the soul. And my point is, if scientists would say, you know, this is a controversial subject, some people talk about the soul, let's argue about it first, um, and they wouldn't operate humans, where would modern medicine be today? So I think that learning about reality by operating the human body and finding out what's inside without worrying about the concept of a soul or other hypotheses, just checking, you know, reality gives us a great benefit because once we understand what the human body is made of, then we can repair it. Then we can design medicine. Then we can invent mRNA vaccine to the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, you know, so... I think that whenever you understand, it's just like going into, uh, coming into a house and not noticing that the door has a lock, but just banging your head on the door or imagining what's on the other side is not a good idea. The best idea is to figure out how the lock works and open it. And the same is true of science. Science opens to us the, uh, the reality that we live in. It allows us to understand it better so that we can open the lock of of our understanding of the meaning of reality, and then we can use it to our advantage. So once you can open the lock, you can use it in technology. Okay, I think that was a very clarifying answer um, to, to, to show the different perspectives. And uh, the scientific perspective, of course, is a totally different one than the philosophic one that, that, I, um, that I tried out. Right. Uh, I would still like, uh, as uh, the ending of our conversation, try to prompt you with an adaptation of the poem um, by Robert Frost. Uh, you, you just talked about a path not taken, and the, the famous uh, poem of the road not taken from 1915 goes uh, in, in that quote, to Two roads diverged in a wood, and I, I took the one less traveled by. That's basically the, the scientific approach you're, you're um, uh, taking in trying to explain to us what could be other explanations for our existence. Now, if I, if I um, um, change that from a multiverse perspective, I could say a universe split into two, and I, I traveled on in both of them, and you say that's basically not possible. Right? No, I want to, you know, I jog every morning at 5 a.m. and I, I really enjoy nature the way it is. I don't imagine nature to be something else. I don't want it to be something else. You know, in love, it's often said that if you really love someone, you want to know everything about that someone. You don't want to imagine that someone is being different than the someone in reality is. True love is understanding all the details of the subject of your love. And so if you care about reality, you want to understand all the details about it. And that should be true for religious people. If they want to uh, appreciate what God did, they should become scientists because that's the best way to understand the subtleties, all the details of reality. And, uh, you know, um, uh, Frost also said that that, taking the road not taken made all the difference for him. For me, there is another advantage, which is very practical. If you take a road that nobody else took, there might be a lot of low hanging fruit that nobody picked up because nobody took that road. So I'm trying to pick up that uh, low hanging fruit. That's very nice. And I also uh, really like that you alluded to love. We had that in the quantum uh, world realm we have been discussing for one and a half days quite often, interestingly enough. And um, knowing everything about a person you love is probably something we, we desire, but maybe with the addition of admiring some of the little secrets that might be left in every human and the world around us. Thank you so much, Avi. That was a wonderful conversation. I really enjoyed it. Thank you for taking the time. My pleasure. Thank you for hosting me.